Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, depending where you are watching us from. And welcome to the Google for Startups UK showcase. Uh, my name is Marta Krupinska and I have the pleasure of leading the team here at um, Google for Startups UK. And I'm so absolutely delighted to have you all calling in uh, to meet 10 exceptional startups that are building wonderful tech all around the UK, as well as to hear from both public and private investors and community builders who will tell us a little bit more about the challenges and the opportunities that building startups all around the UK um, can offer. Uh, before we head into the content, I strongly encourage you all to uh, talk to us, engage with us. Um, those of you that are watching on YouTube, you should see a chat box on the right to the screen in which I'm currently showing. So if you can just maybe kick it off with uh, saying hello and where you're uh, watching us uh, from today. And I'm expecting a good representation of all corners of the UK as well as some international folk. Um, and then we'll be able to head straight into our jam-packed 90 minutes uh, with startups. If we could go to the next slide, please. And by the way, a big shout out to wonderful Andy Watts, who is doing tech for us today. Um, the next 90 minutes, um, as I said, we'll be um, hearing from um, uh, Liz Scott from Tech Nation and Derek Goodwin from the Department of International Trade on the startups and the economic opportunity in the UK. Um, we'll hear from my wonderful colleague, Oliver, um, who'll tell us about the UK immersion program that we've been running here at Google for Startups. Uh, we'll then go into 10 pitches from the startups as well as a Q&A. So remember to get involved in the chat option and ask questions to the entrepreneurs. And we're going to wrap it all nicely up with contributions from two investors that are focusing their efforts into putting money into the startups that are based outside of London. So if we go to the next slide, those of you that are new, to the Google for Startups family. Google for Startups is Google's initiative to help startups thrive across every corner of the world. And we bring the best of Google's products, connections, and best practices to enable startups to build something better. And I am so absolutely convinced that you're going to fall in love as much as I have with the 10 companies that are going to present today, solving such big issues as fake news, or um, access for people with disabilities. So uh, before we head into it, I would like to give a huge shout out to the team that has been working tirelessly to make it all a possibility. If we go to the next slide, um, this beautiful uh, set of people um, are the Google for Startups UK team. Uh, none of what you're going to see today would be possible without them. Uh, so I really want to uh, give a very warm round of virtual applause uh, to the team, um, especially to Mariama and Oliver, who have been working with the founders um, for the past three months, as well as to our global Google for Startups team um, that is supporting all of the efforts um, that we're um, that we're working uh, on here. And it's been it's been a really interesting time. Um, those of us that are all watching on YouTube, you know, some of you used to come to these events in. Campus London or many other campuses that we have around the world. Um, we used to have the pleasure of being able to get together. We used to uh, also have the pleasure of getting together in person with the startups. And obviously, um, as our commitment to working with startups across the country um, was just increasing, we were really excited about going on a tour across the country uh, to meet startups in every corner of the UK. Um, obviously, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit and we all uh, got stuck in our homes. And, I think we're going to hear some very interesting uh, insights from everybody that's going to contribute today about what this meant for startups, especially to those that are based outside of such hubs um, as London. Has it made uh, their life harder? Has it made it easier? Or maybe is it that entrepreneurs and startups, as those who are always working tirelessly to overcome challenges, have actually beautifully adapted to the opportunities and the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic um, offered and off the back of it have created to have managed to create even more value. So without further ado, let's jump straight in and look at the economic opportunity um, that startups create in the UK. If we go to the next slide, um, I will be very 
very honored to be joined by two wonderful people who share their insights with us. But before we go to the panel, I'd like us to hear directly from the entrepreneurs themselves. So we've made a little video uh, with some insights from the cohort that you will be then hearing live uh, during the pitches. So if you can go to the next slide and check out the little video from. Northern Ireland recently has like had a increasingly vibrant startup communities. So it's probably nearly unrecognizable from when we started out just a couple of years ago. Um, so there's like a really strong like tech workforce there is very tech focused, especially in and around Belfast. In Wales, there's a lot of support around you. There's loads of uh, regional support. Um, the networks are smaller than companies in London, but the best thing about that is you get a lot closer to people. Um, the networks, I think, are tighter as a result. So I think it's brilliant that you can build those kind of long-term relationships with partners and, and, uh, and, business, and other businesses around you. We have an amazing legacy to follow in Edinburgh. There are some amazing companies. Um, so Rockstar was based here, uh, Skyscanner's here, uh, Fanjul is here. We've got amazing a legacy of, of amazing startups. So because of that, the people that were connected with those startups are all still here. A lot of them are still here. The entrepreneurial spirit and extensive support network in Oxford um, is also very attractive for small businesses and aspiring startups, including uh, the Oxford Foundry, Oxford University Innovation, and then outside the university, Oxlep is doing uh, fantastic work as well, supporting entrepreneurs and startups. Pre-COVID, I would have said that, you know, not being in, in London presents Welsh startups with some challenges in terms of, you know, being taken seriously, attracting investment. But certainly what we've seen over the past few months, uh, that those geographical challenges have just completely disappeared. And, and to be honest, I'm excited to see how that impacts innovation right across the UK in, in the coming months and years. So we recently closed our first commercial project. And what's really exciting about what we've been doing is people are shocked at what our technology is able to take on. Uh, so they just couldn't believe the kind of things we were able to interpret and the kind of decisions that they were able to make autonomously. So as a startup, we've been going five years and uh, the, the greatest uh, um, highlight, I suppose, is the fact that we're now in a position where we can influence so many young people's education. So the problem that we are tackling at Arwen is a worldwide problem. The fact that we have the solution drives me on a day-to-day -day basis. But also more personally than that is uh, the fact that I have a son and um, and I want to I want him to to grow up in in a world which is um, more secure. Well, now tell me that this isn't an incredible inspiration for a fruitful discussion. And um, I'm so thrilled to enjoy uh, to, to be joined by uh, Liz Scott, uh, Head of Entrepreneur Engagement at Tech Nation, and Derek Goodwin, Head of Entrepreneurship at the DAT and the lead of the Global Entrepreneur Program. So thanks so much for uh, for joining us on this virtual stage. How are you doing? Good. Good. Hope um, uh, we had a little bit of a chat here backstage about, um, you know, the great video and how great it is to hear from the entrepreneurs. Uh, I look forward to hearing your views on 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 the startup opportunity in the UK and the impact it can have on the economy as well. But before, could you just give us a bit of an intro uh, about yourselves and your organizations? Yeah, well, I kick off. off. Um, so I am Liz Scott. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Head of Entrepreneur Engagement at Tech Nation. And at Tech Nation, we are absolutely focused on making the UK the best place in the world to start and grow a tech business. And we provide a whole range of support to, to the founders who are scaling and growing fantastic businesses all over the UK. Um, a lot of what we do through our growth programs. Um, and we also provide some support to the ecosystems that they're based in because we know that actually our founders really thrive in, in healthy ecosystems. Amazing, thanks Liz. What about you, Derek? Yeah, um, good afternoon, good morning and good evening to everyone <laughs> on the call. Um, it, this is becoming more common, this type of virtual presentation. So uh, hopefully I don't uh, drop the ball. Um, yeah, I'm head of the Global Entrepreneur Programme for the Department for International Trade. Essentially, what that is, we 
um, work with uh, internationally mobile entrepreneurs, founders around the world um, who are looking to scale and internationalize their businesses. And we work with them to do that, uh, to help them come into the UK and, and to scale from their UK Global HQ. We've been doing it now for around 15 years. Um, we're unique globally. No other government does does the way we, we do, which essentially we have a team of successful entrepreneurs on, the, on our team who are part-time with us, part-time running their own businesses. But their success in scaling businesses, raising money, go to market strategies, all those things that founders need, they, they, um, they're able to mentor and empower uh, founders from all around the world uh, so that they can um, replicate, hopefully replicate their success. And obviously, this creates significant value to the UK. But I think more, more importantly, what, we're, what I'm trying to do is achieve a global community of tech entrepreneurs that just happen to be based in London, but that, that do business globally from their UK headquarters. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. And it's interesting because both of you have alluded to the UK becoming the best place in the world to build a startup. And uh, we are unique on the on the European scene from the Atomico State of European Tech Report. We know that, uh, la, you know, the UK has still receives the majority um, or the better chunk of the of the European investments, more than eleven uh, billion dollars. We've got a third of uh, European unicorns, twenty nine. Um, we've got one hundred and fifty thousand professional developers. Um, I'm sure that they're enjoying working from lockdown. Um, and uh, but also we know that you know London is a capital for many industries, fintech being one of them. But we also have fabulous hubs such as Manchester and Edinburgh. Now. Why is it important that we engage with the tech communities and with startups all around the country and not just in London? What, what does that mean for you? Liz, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so I think um, as, as your fantastic audience will see in the pictures, there is incredible talent spread across the UK. You know, we have got, as, as you mentioned, we've got these tech clusters and these tech hubs with different levels of maturity. So there's a lot of noise about Manchester. There's a lot of noise about Edinburgh. There's a lot of noise about Cambridge. And really what we're seeing there is ecosystems that are a bit more mature. They've been kicking around for a bit longer. They've had companies go all the way to kind of unicorn status. But actually, you know, you look across the UK, and there are fantastic ecosystems that are, you know, they might still be developing, but they are churning out incredible startups and scale ups. And I think what we get to see when we, we're on fantastic showcases like this is, is the strength and innovation that exists in all of those four corners of the UK. Um, you know, I'm constantly talking to people about the fact that London is this great kind of national asset when it comes to digital tech investment. You know, it's, we are, I think London is, is the third in the world in terms of of levels of investment into tech ecosystems um, as huge, as absolutely huge. And, you know, wherever you are in the UK, it's two, maybe three hours max away on the train to have access to, to that community of investors, whether or not they are in your local ecosystem is, is incredible. Um, I could talk about this all day, but I'm going to let Derek come in because otherwise it's going to be a very one sided <laughs> panel. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess I would say that I don't really so we've been running the program for, for a while now and we have a i don't like targets but we do around 90 to 100 deals a year that means we have 90 to 100 founders that relocate their businesses from all different parts of the world, latin america africa asia europe and uh, north america um we we try to ensure that at least 30 percent of those that come in go to an area outside of london you might want you might ask why well i i think it's I think it sort of alludes very much to what Liz has said, but I don't actually look at, I think I think I've always been, my mantra has always been networks, not location. I think, and I think a founder of a tech, whatever tech business it is, can be successful if he is embedded into a network, he or she is embedded into a network, which enables that company to grow. So if you look at what does that network need, it needs access to capital, it needs access to um talent and access to uh, opportunities so so if you're an agricultural company for instance you're building a new agritech product the last place you want to put that is into london because there's not a lot of agriculture in london so it's really horses for courses and i think the more as the uk has developed and matured as an ecosystem nationally in a, in a global um and globally that that 
the, the reliance upon London will, will diminish because the, and I think this whole COVID and the fact that we're doing this uh, on, on, a, on this live stream shows that, of course, London will always remember, we remain to be the sort of engine for growth to some extent. But, but I think there's so much you can do in the networks that are growing, that the ones that Liz has alluded to and described outside of London. I, you know, I have deal makers in my team that are based in Liverpool, in Bristol, in Manchester, in Newcastle. And deals go there because they're embedded into the networks and they're able to connect them with the people that need that they that our clients need to be able to grow. So I think it, it, it and, and also obviously DIT, or sorry, the Prime Minister has a levelling up agenda. And, and I, I think we should all subscribe to that because we want to share the growth and the opportunity across the UK and not just have it um, specifically in the London area. But, but as I said, it, it comes back to horses to courses and networks, not location. Where can that business be successful? And I think what's happening is as the ecosystems and the networks grow, there is there is less of a dependency on London for that. Yeah. Well, Derek, I'm sure you're going to be uh, delighted to see that a few of our founders that are going to present later are indeed, um, you know, have come from elsewhere because they have found that these respective regions in the UK have been the best place for them to uh, to build their business. Um, you've both sort of alluded to different regions having relevant networks. Have you observed any interesting sort of regional differences or perhaps strengths that different regions have that are particularly fertile to give birth to uh to to businesses or businesses within a certain sector yeah we 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 see a lot of this i think um it, it's interesting to see how those um hot spots and how those areas of specialism kind of crop up. so you'll have some of the obvious ones like where you have um a big investment either from corporate or from the public sector that then leads to this this sort of ripple effect so having nhs digital in leeds for instance having the relationship with the center for aging in the northeast you know you really see a strength in kind of health tech in those regions um as as derek referred to um agritech and even marine tech you know we see that in the parts of the uk that you would expect to see that in in terms of the the southwest and and, and the east um there are fantastic clusters around um around gaming tech and and tech for good that we see in in sometimes quite surprising places you know I, i'm lucky enough to look after a team who is based in the four corners of the uk and when we come together the number of times that someone will say you know I've just come across this fantastic little mini cyber cluster I didn't know that this existed um, and, and you know making the connection between well actually they should really be in touch with this fantastic initiative that's happening in Wales they should really be in touch with this fantastic initiative that's happening in Belfast so we we see a lot of them I would say they there is still a very strong thread of the kind of generic digital tech though through all of the ecosystems. I think it's quite rare to have enough critical mass in any one of those verticals in most of our ecosystems because they're not quite big enough yet. Um, but you do get these kind of surprising bright spots of, um, of specialism. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. And really, really, really interesting. I wonder, Derek, if, if if there is anything you'd like to contribute here. But I also have another question for you, which is you've obviously alluded to, to, to the sort of government vision and the work that you're doing. I wonder sort of what the vision is for, say, five years from now, 10 years from now, when it comes to tech across the UK. Where would you like us to be? And also what you, what you think should be happening in the ecosystem for us to be able to get there? Wow. <laughs> yeah, just, a simple answer. <laughs> just, just a small question there. I mean, I think Oh. And well, Liz, straight over to you. This is the holy grail of, of any live stream. Uh, perhaps uh, Eric was going to drop such uh, such truth bombs. Um, but uh, Liz, do you have a view? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the number one thing that I, I want to see to, to really get us to a place where we've got the confidence and the maturity in ecosystems across the UK that will really let, um, let our startups continue to run and, and, and then grow through to be scale-ups, it's about smart investment. So we need access to capital all across the UK. It is starting to happen. We've got some big ecosystems that are, are on the right path with this, but we've still got too many parts of the UK where it's incredibly difficult to access capital. And, and that's 
I suppose the point here is it's not just about the funding. It's not just about extending a runway and giving our founders a bit longer to to recruit clients or um, to, to 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 expand the team. It's about having expertise. We've got a lot of places in the UK where we haven't had unicorns created yet, so we haven't got that kind of natural expertise in the community on how you scale a business. We need that to come from investors. We need it to come from advisors. So trying to make sure that that is spread as far as we can across the UK is what's going to set us up for success, I think, over the next five years. Amazing. Well, Liz, thank you so much. Uh, you've picked up all the questions. Um, uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, your work that you're doing at Tech Nation is definitely an inspiration for a lot of what we're doing. And I'm so thrilled to see that um, so many of the startups that we'll be presenting today are also beneficiaries and, and graduates of, uh, of your program. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining me this afternoon. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Derek. I hope you're still out there in cyberspace. <laughs> and thank you for your, uh, for your contributions. I'll make sure to pin you down for the answer on that vision um, another time. And in the meantime, I am really excited to introduce you to another wonderful person on the Google for Startups UK team. Oliver, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the UK Immersion Program. Ollie, over to you. Marta, uh, thank you so much for the intro. And what a great occasion to talk about the UK Immersion Program and, and celebrate their journey and achievements so far. So yeah, as Marta mentioned, hi everyone. I'm Oliver Turnbull and I'm part of the programs team at Google Startups London, also known as GFS. I work alongside the fantastic Mariama Bumanjal, who leads all the great program work that we do. For those who aren't familiar with what the programs team do, our main function is to design, build, and deliver all residency and immersion programs. And we are very lucky that every single day, we get the opportunity to work with fantastic founders building fantastic businesses in every single sector that you can imagine. When I joined GFS at the beginning of this year, we were just on the cusp of launching applications for the UK Immersion Programme. And right before lockdown, we visited Wales to get an insight into the challenges that startups are facing. We also got to see firsthand the great work that organizations such as Tramshed and Tech Nation are doing for the local startup ecosystems. And with that said, a special shout out to Gino from Tech Nation who hosted us whilst we were in Cardiff. Hearing from Welsh startups solidified the importance of launching a program which supported founders from outside of, the, outside of London. Even with the lockdown and hours and the founders world changing so dr drastically, we knew as a team that we had to maintain the vision, which is to support founders and their teams as much as possible during these challenging times. And it was more important than ever that we tailored our programs to the remote world while still maintaining that impact and drive that we always strive for. One of the key things that remote working allowed us to do was to bring in more international mentors and experts and to connect and collaborate across our GFS global campuses in ways that we've never done before. So what did the last three months look like for the founders and what does a remote immersion program look like in terms of its structure? Well, one of the key pillars for our programs is connecting, for, connecting our founders with exceptional Google mentors. We are lucky to have access to over 100,000 Googlers globally who are experts in their field and that our founders can tap into that industry knowledge, network and best practice. The second thing is we put a lot of emphasis on building community amongst our cohorts and that's even in a remote world. So we have regular founder stand-ups where we bring in the teams to discuss their highs, their lows and their challenges that they're facing. We also check in on the founders and how they're doing personally. I think if, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that mental well-being is exceptionally important. And it actually, you know what, guys, it's OK not to be OK. We also deliver tailored workshops which are specific to the founders needs. This includes anything from leadership, product development, design sprints, investment. The list goes on. Remote programs has allowed us to bring in experts from further afield and being able to stretch beyond our local markets for expertise has been exceptionally valuable. I've had the pleasure in the last three months of working with 10 great businesses headed by extraordinary founders tackling some of the world's most challenging issues. From a team in Yorkshire using AI to identify fake news to two Edinburgh based founders which build smart solutions based on the challenges that the UK's 13 million strong disabled population face every single day. As a cohort, they've raised millions of pounds, they've continued to hire, they've developed new products, and that's not before the crisis, that is during the crisis. 
And during a time where we've had economic downturn, that's impressive. And it is testament to this fantastic caliber of talent we have on offer in the UK. The UK immersion program for us proved one important thing. Brilliant tech businesses exist outside of the capital and they are led by resilient, driven and highly investable founders who are building impactful and scalable solutions for the future. We've had the pleasure of with, to work with them over the last three months, but I hope that today you enjoy their pitches as we celebrate their achievements and the completion of the UK Immersion Programme. So without further ado, let's meet the startups, starting with Owen Collective from Caerphilly in Wales, headed by Daniel Lewis, CEO and the founder. And guys, don't forget to ask questions in the chat, get involved, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ollie. Owen Collective is a software company making society safer by increasing the cyber resiliency of our critical infrastructures and manufacturers. I'm Daniel, CEO of Arwen, which I founded while living and working in the Welsh Valleys. Next slide, please. And next slide. What would you do if there was a power cut for a few days? What if your water supply became polluted because the treatment system went into overdrive? <clears throat> what if the train stopped working or the traffic lights were stuck on red? These are all very serious questions, which would affect every single one of us. And these problems are increasingly caused by cyber attacks. The risk of cyber attack is only increased as industries bring their legacy equipment into the fourth industrial revolution, potentially leading to big societal disruption. Thankfully at Arwen, we have the solution. Next slide. We've developed software called DOT, which enables industrial organizations to gain full visibility into legacy and newer te devices on their operational technology networks as well as the cyber vulnerabilities of those devices. We provide actionable intelligence on risk and how to mitigate it. What all this means is that every one of us can feel that little bit safer in the knowledge that with DOT by Arwen, our society's energy, water, transportation, and manufacturing organizations are reducing the chance of a cyber attack and improving their response speed. Next slide. We've already discussed the more traditional sectors. However, we are industry agnostic and have use cases in aerospace and defense and in growth sectors such as smart buildings and smart cities. Next slide. We are exactly in the right place at the right time with reports highlighting that we have huge growth potential and that other options just don't solve the problem, whereas we do. This means our addressable market is huge and increasing annually in line with both the cybersecurity and Industry 4.0 markets. Next slide. My wonderful colleagues in Team Arwen have gained their experience from the likes of Darktrace, Airbus, Citrix and the defence sector. I have founded the company after being a senior research fellow in cybersecurity and upskilled in various aspects of business and entrepreneurship through a variety of different programmes and built this amazing team and board around me. Next slide. We love to chat and we are looking to speak with chief information security officers in industrial sectors. Contact us by emailing hello at arwencollective.com. Next slide. Thank you for tuning in today and I hope that I hear from you soon. Are there any questions? So I think we've got a, thanks so much, Daniel, smashed it, the first one to present today. Um, it was such a pleasure to first meet you on a, on a cold, dark night in January at 9 p.m. as you waited for us to get to carefully as we were um, exploring the Welsh, uh, the Welsh tech ecosystem. Um, what you're working on is a big global problem, um, but also sort of something quite easy to understand because it's cybersecurity. But also the product you're building is, is quite quite nuanced. Obviously, there is a lot of incredible IP there. How big of a challenge is it for you as a business to explain the use case? And what are some best practices you use for that? I think certainly um, over the years, it's something that we've um, we've struggled with actually um, because we're, we're in such a, a niche um, that uh, to to 
the general population population it's um uh it, the, people don't know what a plc is um and you know would be confused uh if they heard things like neuralizer and stuff like that but um uh we've we found it very um very much easier as we've gone along and and learn from from the likes of, of this particular program uh about how to to dis discuss uh the subject and and really uh, go into into talking about the solution and the fact that it impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis as a society the fact that that um a, an attack could hit our water companies or our energy companies and, and really cause chaos um and, and that's what we're trying to fix well thanks so much for building such an impactful business and i hope that as you said in the video that we've put together that uh thanks to your work uh the world in which your son will live will be more secure thanks so much congrats on an incredible business um and i'm very excited to introduce the next entrepreneurs that are going to present um as i said everybody get involved with asking the questions there you go welcome daf the founder of concentric health Hi, I'm Dav, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Concentric Health and how we're transforming how we make decisions about our health. Decision making in healthcare is broken. These are life changing decisions that too often are made for us, not with us, and feel difficult to engage with. So in healthcare, consent is given before any treatment or surgery is started. And the process of sharing information and documenting consent is traditionally done on paper often on carbon copy forms. It's a poor experience for patients and clinicians alike, and as a paper process is increasingly incompatible with post-COVID healthcare. So at Concentric Health, our mission is to transform how decisions are made about our health, decisions informed by patient outcomes and shared by patients and clinician. Concentric, our digital consent application, uh, enables consent consultations to be digital and remote. Personalized evidence based information is shared with patients, leading to informed shared decisions. And this has the potential to impact lives globally by empowering patients to be able to engage with and understand and own decisions by releasing time spent by clinicians filling forms so that it can be used instead to support patients making critical decisions. And especially during this time, by avoiding risky hospital visits, by enabling remote consent consultations. And this is a global market. There are 600 million consent interactions globally per year, interactions that are a required part of each of those healthcare journeys. In the medium term, we see much of the value that we can deliver being an outcome prediction, driven by our unique position to capture patient outcomes and using these predictions to support the next patients needing to make decisions about treatment. And this is a paper process in an increasingly digital world, globally with few exceptions and due to the significant barriers to entry, both having clinical content across thousands of treatments, but also the understanding and ability to deliver technology that is used right in the clinical consultation and used by both patient and clinician. Need treatment? Well, you might see Concentric. We launched in March 2020 at Imperial in London and are currently rolling out trust-wide. Since May, we've been onboarding an organization every week. And we believe this is a team to deliver. Here are our three founders, myself, Ed and Martin. And between us, we have the experience of scaling health tech, deep domain knowledge and the technical expertise to deliver. So join our journey, in particular, we're looking to accelerate adoption outside the UK. Can you help? Please do get in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daph. Absolutely love what you're building, especially as I think all of us have become much more in tune with what's happening in the world and our health and sort of the decisions that we need to be taking off the back of this whilst we, of course, are not all um, experienced clinicians. You made yeah. a really interesting point that what you're building can help take better decisions whether we should be going into hospitals during the time where some of us, especially those more at risk, should not really be exposing themselves to, to potentially contracting coronavirus. What's been happening in your business during the during the corona pandemic? Do you feel there's been more interest in, in your proposition? 
Yeah, absolutely. So as part of, you know, we're one of a number of people in health tech who have just seen a real shift between what was previously us trying to kind of push our technology and our solutions and, you know, making people aware of some of the problems that were niggling, you know, day to day. Suddenly that's changed, you know, 180 degrees. Suddenly, you know, everyone needs, you know, it's people coming to us and asking for solutions you know, on a daily basis. Um, and the, the move in health tech has been incredible over the last um, couple of months. And um, I think, you know, everyone's kind of saying, you know, we've seen 10 years, 20 years of innovation in, in two months time. And, um, you know, we've seen that across industries, but I think particularly in, in health tech. Amazing. Well, congratulations on an awesome business. I also have to say Wales is really kicking it today. Um, so, uh, yeah, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us and Thank looking you. forward to staying in touch and seeing you achieve all these uh, all these great successes. Um, and I'm really uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next founder to pitch to you today, Sarah Minty from Developing Experts. Thanks, Martha. Really delighted to be here from sunny Norfolk. Um, I'm Sarah Minty. I'm the uh, Developing Experts founder and CEO. Uh, next slide, Andy. Thanks. Tracy is 18. She spent the past two years studying to train as a hairdresser. She's achieved top marks in all of her classes. Tracy's mum is a hairdresser too. In the past two months, she's applied for 12 different hair salon jobs, but sadly hasn't managed to secure a position. That's because for every hairdressing vacancy in Great Yarmouth, there are 10 applicants. Yet for every level two engineering post, a post worth three times the starting salary, not a single local young person had the qualifications needed to access the opportunity. Tracy isn't aware of the opportunities in engineering. The wind sector deal sets the target of recruiting 274,000 new engineers by 2030. It also sets a BAME female employment target of 40%. For this to be achievable, one in six candidates appointed from today onwards needs to be female. At the moment, companies struggle to attract a single female applicant. Next slide, Andy, thanks. In 2015, uh, 2019, sorry, the DfE's research highlighted that children rule out careers between the ages of nine and 13. And they make gender stereotype judgments between the ages of six and eight. So unless you're product placing your career opportunity in the curriculum before the age of six, you're already reducing your talent pipeline. Developing experts enables industry to product place their career opportunity within our science curriculum. We've now teamed up with the rail sector to deliver an adult version of our site. Next slide, Andy. I designed the platform for the Chinese government to enable them to centrally set, track and monitor the performance of each child, class, year group, school and group of schools in real time. What I didn't appreciate was the value our data provides to industry. Companies can now track their return on investment for their school inspiration work. Next slide, Andy. The Chinese government has agreed to sell our product direct to their schools. In the UK, our talent pipeline has a target of 1.5 billion. This figure is over 1.2 um, trillion in the States. Next slide. The life cycle of a nuclear power station from commissioning to decommissioning is 100 years. Based on the profile of other power station managers, Hinkley Point C's future manager is currently age seven. We therefore know based on the development cycle of Hinkley, what year the next power station manager is in and what, what year he's needed. By pushing out the right messaging through our curriculum, we can help to recruit Hinkley's future power station manager. Next slide, Anne, thanks. The Chinese government has listed our resources on their teacher training platform. In the past week alone, over 500 schools have signed up. In addition to this, seven tier two cities want our resources from September. 
We estimate our Chinese sales over the next year to be worth anywhere between six and 40 million pounds. We've also appointed, we've also been appointed by the rail sector in the UK to address their skills and career solution. Next slide, thanks. Our board is made up of industry leaders who have built and float up global brands. I was previously the CEO of a successful business with over 200 staff and volunteers. I've also been a head teacher. My co-founder and CTO Shane has developed an assortment of platforms uh, for leading brands. And final slide, thanks. I'd welcome introductions to industry leaders who have companies with more than 500 employees. Thanks for listening. Sarah, you seem to have captured the hearts and minds of YouTube. You're getting a lot of love in the comments section. Uh, so congratulations on the incredible business. Um, EdTech is obviously yet another example of an industry that has been transformed by the coronavirus pandemic, or at least our, our shared understanding as a society has certainly, um, has certainly increased. Um, do you believe that solutions like, your, like yours will be or will become more mainstream as the world move forward? So say in 10 years, 20 years, the sort of mix of going to schools and remote learning um, through platforms like yourselves, do you believe that you are part of the changing face of education? Uh, Marta, I, I think we have to become the changing face of education because at the moment, education, business, um, training pathway providers, they operate governments, they operate in silos. Unless they start connecting the dots between those different silos, mm -hmm. uh, we're never going to have a society that really enables everyone to reach and realise their potential, particularly young people. And that's what drives me. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, if we don't have any other questions for Sarah, make sure that you get your, uh, everybody get your leads and introductions for Sarah so that Sarah can help us educate the next generation of innovators and leaders um, in our world. And in the meantime, Sarah, thank you so much. Congrats on the great business. And I am really excited to be joined by our next GFS UK immersion uh, company, Fluence, led by Dave and Jennifer. Thanks, Marta. We're Jen and Dave, co-founders of Fluence. We are based out of Birmingham and we have built along with our team, of course, the Fluence Engine. Next slide, please. So the Fluence Engine is a document understanding AI and it learns to interpret complex documentation in the same way that a skilled professional would. Next slide, please. The idea is that we have combined three proprietary technologies in order to mimic the approach that a professional would take to understanding a document. So we use natural language processing techniques to understand what a document is about. We use forensic linguistic techniques to understand how well a document is performing. And we have a proprietary algorithm that then combines conclusions from the above in order to replicate what the skilled professional would have said if they'd read the document. Next slide, please. So in a world where content is doubling every year, if not greater we're all about freeing up the experts time and helping them perform better humans can process 450 words per minute but with our technology at their fingertips they can process up to a million words per minute we're also trying to help eliminate biases and help combating uh, decision fatigue so as we get tired we might not make the same decision as when we're fresh at the start of our day next slide please so we've split our product into three product, uh, our engine into three product classes. Uh, the idea is the first one developed during COVID and with Google support is our research automation tool where a user can read a few hundred documents and then the logic that they've applied to those documents is applied to millions of other documents within large data sets. And we're using that for competitor analysis and prior art and IP management. Uh, next, uh, could you click next a couple of times, please? Thank you. <laughs> The next product is Fluence Arbiter, and that is a process automation tool that sits between inbound uh, content from, from the public and the team that may have to process that information. And the idea is we protect those teams from unbelievable amounts of inbound content. And then the final one, and this is what we were developing before COVID, uh, it's, a, it's a high stakes decision support tool where we work alongside um, skilled professionals to come up with the best possible decision given the data. Uh, and, and the idea is that if you could go to the next slide, please, is we've differentiated our engine 
to make sure that we're giving people a nice, easy journey through the AI adoption curve to make sure that they're starting with something manageable, such as surfacing and intelligence, before ramping up to really high stakes decision support. Next slide, please. So we've now completed, um, have finished in the last couple of months, uh, two use cases in our uh, beachhead market of education. So we've proven that our technology was able to wipe out 50% of the workload associated with compiling exam papers for Northern Ireland. And we were also able to uh, explain how we could coordinate education standards. So having hundreds of teachers coordinating identical standards across 34 prisons in the UK. So we're delighted. Next slide, please. So I'm the CEO and I'm uh, focused on building the world's best products and capabilities. And I'm the CEO and I focus on the business ledge strategy. Next slide, oh, next please. Slide, please. <laughs> So we have an absolutely amazing team with a unique combination of skills and expertise that have allowed us to build the Fluence engine and we're growing. So if you know anyone that's interested in our technology, come and speak to us. Next slide, please. So we have an ask for anyone who's on the webinar today. We are making our discovery product available as a free beta trial to anyone who's on the, uh, on the, on the call. And the idea is it works by, so our competitor analysis products work by submitting a website. The software will recommend relevant companies. And then as you make decisions about those companies, the AI learns what your research objectives are. So when you reprocess the, um, the list, it will build a new model and then read all of the documents remaining in the list, so millions of documents, and then apply your logic to all of them, meaning that you can do, if you could click next, um, you could do, for example, prior art searches in an hour or competitive, you know, exhaustive competitor analysis in 30 to 40 minutes. So that, I would really appreciate your help in helping us testing that. I'm going to post uh, some uh, a link to the beta trial in the comments. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jen, Dave, thanks so much for the excellent pitch, and I love that you're 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 already getting on with it. You know, posting the beta. You know, give us give us some feedback. I think this is is absolutely absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm so impressed that such complex AI is being built. You know, in in Birmingham, that uh, sort of you're bringing this product to uh, to the market. Could you tell us a little bit more about your business model? Yes. So it was starting in. We were focusing on regulators before COVID hit, and we realized that we were selling something that was very, very big. And we realized that it was a long sales cycle, so maybe a year long sales cycle, and it was really slowing us down because we weren't getting the traction we wanted. So what we've decided is to divide the engine and build much smaller product classes. And this was with Google's help, uh, with the idea of trying to make it a lot more bite-sized manageable. So we've got smaller products that get ourselves in the door with large with large organizations. So for example, with um, IP searching, for example, prior art searching. And then once they're comfortable that they're using that technology and they say, what else could we do with this? We can then upsell products such as automated document review. And then as they feel even more comfortable, we then get escalate the process to say, let's take on some really big decisions. So for example, we're looking at MA um, due diligence, for example, uh, freedom to operate searches, that kind of stuff where there's very high stakes decisions being made. All right, brilliant. Um, and I think we've got a question, uh, but I'll ask you for a very quick answer. What would you do with the decision-making data? And would you think that this is a customer security breach? So we don't own any of the data that passes through us, and we make sure that none of the data we receive is is um, is uh, is affected by GDPR in any way, shape, or form. We tend to so with some of our providers, uh, our uh, clients, we actually air gap the technology, so they're actually deploying it within their own environments. Uh, so there's all sorts of techniques, and I, I would say that people, you know, if if a document's on on Google Docs, it's no more of a problem than, than applying it to another secure provider. Brilliant. Thanks so much, uh, Dave and Jennifer, for your presentation. Congrats on the amazing business. Thanks Thank for, uh, uh, for the program and for uh, today's presentation. And without further ado, let's go to Mehak, who is going to present. I love. Thank you, Marta. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mehak. I'm a uh, co-founder of ILOF, or Intelligent Lab on Fiber. Next slide, please. Neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's are the most terrifying diseases of aging, gradually robbing us of our identity and dignity. 
Yet, as our world ages, a third of us will end our lives this way. Despite this number, there is still no disease-modifying therapy for the disease in the market. And this is not due to lack of trying. In the past 14 years, there have been more than 400 failed clinical trials. Now, why is it so difficult to develop treatments for the disease? Next slide, please. Firstly, Alzheimer's disease is a heterogeneous disorder, which is often not taken into account during trial design. Stratifying patient populations effectively is hence crucial for personalized therapies. Next slide, please. Secondly, clinical trials themselves have massive challenges. They're invasive, they're difficult to access, leading to 90% of patients dropping out, translating to massive costs for drug discovery. Next slide, please. This has led to many pharma companies abandoning their clinical development program, depriving millions of patients from a cure. Next, please. Hence, clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease desperately need our help. And this is the heart of the problem that we are solving at ILOF. Next, please. ILOF is a revolutionary platform technology which can stratify patients based on their biological profiles, removing variability and enabling the development of personalized medicine. Next, please. Using our patented photonics and artificial intelligence platform, we analyze blood samples, acquiring a backscattered signal, which is processed into an optical fingerprint. This is then compared with our cloud-based fingerprint library for potential matches, leading to detection of biomarkers and profiles in a non-invasive, adaptable, fast, and low-cost way. Next, please. Our initial focus is on solving the industry problem by making clinical trials more efficient and transforming the overall experience for patients. Following on, we have plans to enter the healthcare market to provide the right treatment to the right patient. Our first product is a stratification tool. Next, please. Next slide, please. This stratification tool enables pharma companies to cut down 40% of their costs and 70% of the time taken to recruit patients in trials, at the same time making it much more convenient for patients. Next, please. Our beachhead market consists, sorry, can you skip uh, these slides, please? Next, next, please. Yeah, um, so our beachhead market consists of top four pharma companies that currently spend more than 400 million a year on screening costs with a total screening market of more than a billion. Next, please. This is what makes us um, unique. ILOF offers easy validation, is low cost, fast, and very importantly, versatile and agnostic. Next, please. We are a validated platform technology, and our vision is to use AI to train and screen for multiple diseases with unmet need, accelerating the drug discovery and development process. Next, please. So far, we've achieved validation of various biomarkers with partnerships with two pharma companies, and we've secured a seed investment of $3 million from Microsoft Ventures, Mayfield Fund, and EIT Health. We're now looking for more clinical and pharma partners to fast-track development and deployment of our tech. Next, please. We won a number of tech and enterprise awards, and our founders have been recently recognized by Forbes as 30 under 30. Next, please. We have a stellar and diverse team of scientists, researchers, and entrepreneurs brought together by shared passion for solving the biggest problems in healthcare. Next, please. We're very grateful to Google for Startups for giving us this opportunity and platform, and we hope that you can join us on our vision and mission to preserve memories for Alzheimer patients around the world. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mahak. Fantastic business, great presentation. I will definitely say um, I lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's and as it's a hereditary disease, uh, I have vested personal interest in you becoming incredibly successful um, on, uh, on your journey. We've got a question from Alana, if you could just clarify what a biomarker is because um, you were referring to it uh, in your presentation. And I also have a question, which is um, what would you need to be able to expand your platform to all the other diseases that you uh, mentioned are in your vision board? Great question. So firstly, our platform is agnostic to biomarkers. So we um, partner up with um, either clinicians or academic partners who have discovered um, biomarkers. And we then use um, 
uh, our platform to be able to detect these biomarkers. And since we're agnostic, we're a platform, we can sort of look for multiple and any um, biomarker. So that's for the first question. And for the second one, um, it's all really about training and validation, Marta. So we are cu currently, in order to get to these other disease areas, we're looking for data sets, we're looking for blood samples um, and accompanying um, clinical and biological data, which we can then use to train our um, uh, algorithms in order to detect uh, biomarkers and profiles. Mm -hmm. So if any of you out there um, have a clinician or academic background, we'd love to speak to you. Fantastic. Mahak, thank you so much. Congratulations. Uh, and hope to see you soon and hear about all the great things that you're building. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And uh, without further ado, um, I hope, I think we're halfway through. Hope you're as excited as I am. And we are, um, we are now going to hear from Lyric, who's going to talk about Logically. Hi, everyone. I'm Lyric from Logically. We fight misinformation at scale uh, around the world. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a problem that we're all familiar with. We experience it as consumers of information on platforms who face challenges upholding their own policies, who themselves are under pressure from brands and advertisers who don't want to associate their brands with misinformation. And finally, we have governments that are concerned about the public safety and national security implications of such content and activity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, where do we fit in? Uh, we believe there's unlikely to be any silver bullets and obvious that the best all stakeholders can do is bake in highly scalable mitigation strategies that work in as close to real time as possible. And that's exactly what we do. We identify as much of this content as we can using a combination of artificial and human intelligence, deploying outright automation where we're confident and providing assistive bots to our, to our analysts to make sure uh, they can effectively make quick decisions in sensitive situations. Um, in addition to identifying problematic content, we propose and deploy countermeasures from fact checking to strategic communications. We've now done this uh, in, in various environments, in, including one uh, where we 10 x throughput uh, versus competitive offerings on a, on a leading social network. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we work at the intersection of three main markets, um, content moderation, threat intelligence, and brand safety, uh, and uh, typically work only on text-based content um, and in three countries, in the UK, in the US, and in India. And uh, altogether, our beachhead market is at around 210 million, uh, but, but the overall market uh, that we want to address uh, is, as you can probably tell growing at a, at a fairly significant rate. Uh, next slide, please. There's various ways uh, to slice and dice our space. Our positioning against competitive offerings is to act in close to real time, scale rapidly, and cover as many cases as possible. Uh, as opposed to competitors who offer retrospective analysis and civil society initiatives that are powerful, uh, but often act too late. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've initially focused East and in the UK, where we've served our public sector partners and our platform partners across four, ele four elections and a pandemic. Uh, we've been scaling up ahead of the US elections and have hired over 25 people during lockdown. Uh, and through the Immersion program, uh, we've been supported to overcome a lot of the uh, growing pains that come from being a high growth scale up. Uh, so uh, we were helped in introducing OKRs uh, and also uh, with a lot of support through um, uh, other teams within Google. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is our, our team. Uh, I'm a second time founder. I, I founded a previous business that uh, is successful and profitable. And uh, the, the, the team uh, on the screen right now um, each have a decade's worth of experience uh, in each of their fields. And they lead a near 100 person organization today. Uh, next slide. And there's uh, an awful lot more uh, for, uh, of space left for us to grow into uh, in, in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, we're looking for talented and motivated people uh, to join us in um, full-time and in advisory capacities, uh, people who are motivated by our mission. Uh, and we'll also be raising some capital uh, next year uh, to support our expansion across the pond. Uh, so looking forward to uh, hearing from you, uh, especially if you're in uh, either of those two groups. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, the, for listening. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Lyric, thanks so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, I think we all have a feeling that um, your product has never been as 
needed as it is today. Uh, so, uh, so certainly fantastic to hear about everything that you're achieving. It's fantastic to hear about uh, your recent fundraise. It's great to see that despite the conversations that we're having around sometimes access to access to funding being a challenge if you're net, but not based out of London, you being able to continuously overcome uh, overcome these challenges. So you're clearly doing incredibly well for yourself. Um, tell us about building a business in Yorkshire. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, we, we like to call our town the Brig Apple. Uh, it's, it's based in a little town uh, 20 minutes from uh, Leeds. And uh, it's, it's um, a quiet place, but it's a fantastic ecosystem because it's supported by uh, a lot of universities nearby, Sheffield, Leeds, Huddersfield, um, and it, it's it's uh, really uh, easy to get access to a lot of good talent, and uh, it also gives us uh, a lot of space to grow into. Uh, so I uh, really enjoy our time in Leeds, but uh, equally aware we're based out of kind of four locations globally now, so uh, in the UK as well as in India, and soon, whenever COVID uh, restrictions die down, we'll be opening up uh, stateside as well. Fantastic, and you've mentioned that you're. Uh... Uh, you will be raising Series A, preparing for the U.S. election. Tell us what's your what's 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 your vision? What would you like for? What role would you like logically to play uh, in the upcoming U.S. election? Sure. Uh, so we'll be supporting two sets of partners mainly: uh, our platform partners and our public sector partners. And there's again two very different challenges. There's the domestic threats uh, if, if various stakeholders acting politically to, to influence news feeds and to promote uh, disinformation. And there's the national security threat. Uh, we've known uh, for a long time that countries such as Russia and China uh, take a very active role in, in the US elections and UK elections. And we'd like to work with uh, some of the federal stakeholders there to mitigate against those risks. And in some news where we're launching our consumer products in, in the US very soon. Uh, so it's it's our app. It, it provides users with an automated fact-checking service as well as a contextualized news feed. Uh, so that, that's coming up in three weeks' time uh, in the US. Well, incredibly exciting. And well, I hope that everybody feels even more rewarded that they joined the GFS UK Immersion uh, Showcase this afternoon because you're getting straight hot off the press uh, product launches. Uh, Lyric, congrats to you and the team for building an incredible business. Um, really, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and as we sort of ventured north uh, to meet Logically in Yorkshire, I'm very excited to now move to Edinburgh, um, where we're going to meet with Gavin, the founder of Meatbox. Hello, Google and everybody else, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, before I start, uh, please make a mental note uh, this is very much, or could very much be, one of those moments when you think, why didn't I think of that? Uh, Ken walks into a shop. He's got money in his pocket, and he even knows what he wants to buy. He stands for five minutes, sighs, turns, and walks out without making a purchase. Ken is blind, and he's one of the UK's 13 million disabled people who together, and in the UK alone, spend £274 billion every year. Sadly, people like Ken are also the most discriminated against by businesses. In a recent study by Scope, it was found that 75% of disabled people have stated that they have received customer service so poor that they have left a shop totally dissatisfied. It occurred to me that if a disabled visitor could use their smartphone to inform the service team of their intention to visit and coupled this with the phone's location awareness, staff could be trained in how to interact in the moment it was needed most. Slide three, apologies. Uh, in 2018, we launched the Welcome platform. It's a cloud-based, easily accessed system that utilizes geolocation and has quickly proved it's possible to raise awareness of an arrival and prepare staff in a way which totally revolutionized service delivery. Slide four. We're often asked about our results and we look forward to your deep dive but by way of underlining what is possible in retail alone, House of Fraser installed Welcome in 2018 and immediately turned their dreadful service for disabled customers from a one-star review every visit to five stars every single visit. Slide five. Our members are our greatest asset, and we love that they create our sales pipeline, telling us and their favorite venues where they want us next. This has led to a remarkable and growing sales pipeline. And to say that international opportunities for our service are massive is truly an understatement. Slide six. Whilst we have no direct competition, the few who are in this space focus on specific sectors, whereas we provide a smart solution for all venues across all sectors. 
slide seven. With over 60 venues on the platform and more getting in touch and progressing relationships every week, we are confident we have differentiated ourselves in a market significantly and already proving we can continue to grow exponentially in the coming months. Slide eight. Our team is small, but we pride ourselves on delivery through efficiency and have most most certainly proved what's possible when you combine truly innovative ideas and dedicated purpose-driven individuals. Slide nine. We're growing and your help will come in the form of finance, advice, and quite obviously through improving your own services by purchasing the product yourselves. So get in touch. And remember, you don't have to have thought of the idea yourself to be amongst the first to benefit from it. Thank you. Gavin, thanks so much. I love the energy that you bring to the room and the passion with which you speak about what you've built is it's just it's, it's, it's just excellent. Um, you uh, you make a fantastic point about when talking about Neatbox. You talk about uh, sort of the, the people with disabilities being seen as the marginalized group that we can't see and we can't hear, so we don't necessarily understand the economic opportunity or the business opportunity that's associated. So can you just remind us what would it mean for us as a society and for our economy if we could properly serve that demographic? Uh, so um, a fifth of the world's population are living with some form of disability. Uh, that's an eight trillion pound spend or dollar spend every single year. Uh, it, it's, it's massive. It's absolutely ginormous. We're the only company that have actually designed and developed and, and used this system. So it's, it's massive. But for the people... The idea of being able to leave your house, especially now, to go into a shop, knowing that the people in the shop already know how to interact with you, purely because you've just approached the shop. It's just so simple. Yeah, fantastic. Gavin, thank you so much for uh, for joining us this afternoon. I think there's another question or two on YouTube for you to answer by text, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, no really, thank you. really enjoyed working with you the past three months. And we're moving on to our next presenter, uh, hey, Fargo, and looking forward to hear about PitchBook. Sure. So, hi, everyone. My name is Fergal. I'm one of the co-founders of PitchBooking, which is a scheduling and payment solution for sports facilities. So, we can go to the next slide, Andy. Right now in the UK, 15 sports facilities are forced to close every single week. And at PitchBooking, we don't believe this is lack of demand for sports facilities. Instead, it's a lack of easy access to them. Because think of a sports facility near you, one in your local community. Assuming you can actually uncover the booking process in the first place, it tends to be some complicated amalgamation of phone calls, emails, online request forms, and different payment methods. Not exactly what you'd expect in 2020, but we're changing that. So in the next slide, Andy. We allow you, the general public, to find, book, and pay for a sports facility of your choosing, all in under 60 seconds. Receive an email confirmation of your booking there and then. And on the next slide, the managers of the facilities as well get the tools to better manage this process on any device at any time. Now, I mentioned earlier that we don't see it as a lack of demand, and we have some numbers to back that up. So if we skip to the next slide, I can tell you that with our early customers, we've seen an average of 56% increase in booking volume when they came onto our platform. We would say that's not due to some fancy marketing campaign or paid advertisements. I was just being moved from the old manual processes to using an online solution like ours. I'm going to skip to the next slide. There's a big market here for this as well. So if we captured 100% of our potential customers in the UK and Ireland, that would bring in 640 million pound each year in recurring revenue to pitch booking. Across Western Europe, this number is 4 billion. And that number doubles again if you look at the USA. And skip to the next slide. We currently have over 1,000 facilities across 105 locations in the UK and Ireland. And next slide. So the team, the three founders are childhood friends who have this issue ourselves, looking to have easily accessible sports facilities in our uh, around us in our like local area. And we've also built out our team. So on the next slide, um, you can see we have ha made hires Daryl, Daniel, and Ryan across both software engineering and customer success. And next slide. So our ask today is really simple. I think there are about 250 people in the audience. So from each of you, all we're asking is for one introduction. You'll either know somebody who works 
on a local community, like as a volunteer in a community club, or you know like a sports facility in around your locality, or perhaps you know someone who is involved with perhaps one of the sporting government bodies, we'd ask for an introduction to tell them about what we're doing and how we can help their facilities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Virgil, for this incredible presentation. And I am sure that since the lockdown is slowly lifting, you must be growing like crazy, given the fact that I, I think I've struggled for the past month to book a tennis facility one. Because everyone is so excited not to have to be stuck at home all the time. Um, you obviously work in physical locations. So there have been some interesting leadership and management challenges over the past few months. What's, what's the most important thing that you've learned as a leader of a startup um, in this period? Yeah, I would suppose it's probably the same for every startup to an extent. Um, that it was obviously a very, uh, when lockdown went into place on 16th of March, all of our customers' revenues dropped to zero overnight. And that was just the nature of where we're working. So we had a very, I suppose, worrying March and April. But I suppose what we've learned is a little bit of patience almost in what we do. So we've actually seen at the back end of this that a number of local councils have been really eager to get something up and running because there's a big opportunity here at the back end of it, of course, because as you can imagine, online bookings and cashless payments are really hot for almost every industry right now. That's exactly where we operate. So, yeah, I suppose just seeing having a bit of patience, not overreacting and seeing what good can come out the far side of it too. It's been really useful for us. Amazing. Thank you. And well, congratulations for powering through and 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 doing such a brilliant uh such brilliant job and, and also so great to see the 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 increasing uh tech community in Belfast, Northern Ireland. So thanks, thanks so much, Harry. We'll really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. Move on to our next slice up, our next presenter, Lindsay from Sparkbox. Hi, hi Marta, um, and hi everyone. Um, I'm Lindsay. I'm a co-founder at Sparkbox, and we help retailers sell more inventory more profitably by optimizing their pricing. So it's July, which means it's clearance season on the high street. Um, Andy, if you just want to pop through, pop through these slides um, as you like. But um, it's clearance season on the high street for obvious reasons. The sales are bigger than ever this year. Um, you see the discounts online or maybe in store, and perhaps you've wondered how retailers decide which products should get which discounts and when. Uh, it might surprise you to learn that most retail uh, pricing decisions are currently based on intuition rather than on data. And that's because the humans behind these decisions manage thousands of products and millions of data points, um, but they don't have tools to connect the two. If you just want to stop the slides there. Sorry, I have a lot. <laughs> Um, but getting price right can deliver huge returns and pricing is even more important as our industry recovers from COVID. So Sparkbox is a platform that my team and I built to take the guesswork out of pricing. Our solution is a cloud application and it turns data into profitable pricing decisions. So we use machine learning to understand how customers respond to price. If you want to pop the slide, please. Um, and when it's time for a promotion or markdown, we forecast the outcome of all possible pricing decisions. Next slide, to find the price that will help retailers reach their goals most profitably. Next slide, Sparkbox helps retailers um, sell through their problematic inventory while improving cash profit by 20%. So last season, we made a recommendation to a client that impacted just a few products, but it netted them half a million pounds of profit in just a couple of weeks. Overall, um, we're returning at least 12 times ROI, and we're going, we get going really quickly because we don't require IT integration, uh, and our solution works for both e-commerce and physical retail. Next slide. Uh, retailers spent more on AI systems than banks did in 2019, and we're addressing a market that's growing at 40% annually uh, to reach 8 billion by 2024. Two slides, please. Uh, I need less slides next time. Uh, McKinsey estimates that within this market, pricing and promotions is the single biggest area of opportunity for AI in retail. Next slide. Um, the market, though, is really fragmented at the moment, and there's no clear share leader. Next slide. We're delivering uh, best-in-class analytics with less than half the time the team and the budget it would take a retailer to deploy an alternative. So really, our competition is Excel. Next slide. Um, we're working with 
an audience that is a little bit reluctant to change. And our biggest USP is our understanding of how our end users actually make decisions. So we're replacing Excels like this one um, with the next slide. Uh, and we'll win in this market uh, by, by replacing spreadsheets with innovative solutions that actually stick with our users. So next slide, our team is building uh, this product based on firsthand experience with the problem. Um, we previously worked in consultancy where we built custom pricing solutions for retailers like Topshop. And our founding team includes former merchandisers, a former Accenture retail partner, and a vice president at Best Buy, uh, and of course, a software developer. Next slide. Uh, in the last 18 months, we've launched our first product with a paying customer. They're a fast fashion retailer, and they turn over about 500 million annually. Um, we've grown our team and our sales pipeline, and we've been recognized by Tech Nation, Retail Week, and Forbes. We raised a small investment in March, but otherwise we're self-funded uh, and our MR is currently about 15K. So finally, we wanna say a huge thanks to the Google team um, for having us and for their hard work remotely over the last few months. Uh, and next slide, we're keen to connect with investors and anyone in the retail community. Uh, and final slide, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, or by email. It's lindsay at sparkbox.co. We are sparkbox.co. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Excellent presentation. And we've got a question from Alana. Do you think this could have a positive impact on moving volume and inventory for brick and mortar stores post COVID? Yeah, I think it's a good question. We work primarily with fashion and seasonal retailers, so they've been probably most impacted by excess out of season stock. Um, but what's really interesting is that we're seeing some cool data to show that in some cases, uh, customers are spending more on new areas than they were before. So it's not as straightforward as everyone wants a discount on everything right now. And what our technology can do is look at what needs what discounts and why in a really scalable way. Um, for the retailers. So I think the biggest thing we're seeing in retail right now is that like going forward, um, we're not going to be able to predict demand as easily as, as we would in the past and, and based on intuition. And tools like this are really becoming absolutely essential in, in ensuring that we can actually exit inventory and move into new seasons profitably. So definitely is the answer. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much. Congrats on a great business. Really enjoyed your presentation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to hear only one more pitch. So last but not least, uh, welcome Peter, uh, founder of Circle. Thanks, Mada. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here to speak to you today. Uh, my, my name is Peter Allen, and I'm co-founder and CEO at Circle. Uh, and we're a team of software developers and data scientists who are based in sunny South Wales in Newport. And we're driven by a single unifying purpose. And for us, that is all about mitigating the effects of the global climate crisis, which is already having such an incredibly negative impact on our planet. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest contributing factors to that is energy waste. And our mission as a business is to eradicate business energy waste. And um, we have a problem. Uh, a lot of energy is being wasted by businesses, and that's bad for everyone involved. Businesses need a way to act. Next slide, please. So. We build software that helps organizations to make smarter energy, energy decisions. Uh, but who is it that actually prevents energy waste and makes these smarter energy decisions? Well, typically it's the energy managers or consultants. These are the real life superheroes who are just doing their bit to save the planet. And they can't do it without great tools. Next slide, please, Andy. Uh, which is exactly why we build our energy management software. Like I said, we're founded out of a purpose, but also a need. And that need was one we discovered when talking to energy managers who just wanted us to build a tool that made their job simpler. Historically, the journey to energy efficiency for businesses was slow and tedious. Businesses needed to navigate several systems to build a full picture of their energy use and did much of that analysis manually. So now with Serpil, businesses can see all of their electricity, gas, water and generation data in one system and get unique insights powered by our machine learning algorithms, speeding up that journey to energy efficiency. Next slide, please, Andy. Uh, I'm part of a Google presentation, so I feel this is the at last, the, the place I can use this quote from a customer. Um, but yes, we are essentially the Google Analytics for energy. So in the same way that Google Analytics gives you insights into your website's performance, we do the same for your building and energy performance. We take energy data in, we analyze it, and we produce automated insights for our users, taking away all that difficult legwork. And whilst the energy management software market is a really competitive place, and there are lots of solutions vying for market share, it's exactly why we've never seen this market as our end goal. We see an opportunity to build something more, Next slide, please, Andy. 
Uh, our ambition is to build upon our existing product and develop a marketplace for products that improve energy efficiency. So Serpa will take all of your building data into account and be able to recommend areas where further efficiency would be possible and then recommend the associated product. So whether it's a hybrid boiler, a new more efficient hand dryer or just LEDs that you need, you'll be able to find it on Serpa and begin to invest to save in the most trusted way possible. This means we won't just be that energy management software solution, we'll be an end-to-end -end energy decision-making tool. We'll take people from understanding their energy consumption to identifying energy waste and inefficiencies, all the way through to offering them the perfect fix or solution and finally tracking its success. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've developed a brilliant tool that helps customers to save energy, time and money. Uh, and one of our case studies where we've uh, saved in excess of £30,000 in annual savings. Uh, we've won awards for our work helping to reduce energy consumption across the public sector. But really, we're just getting started, and it's now about how we help businesses to manage their transition to reduce the states and better work working practices post-COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're a young and ambitious team looking to grow significantly in the next six months. We've delivered an exceptional product to market in under a year. And as we onboard more clients, we know that we can do more with the tech we've developed to date. And we're keen to prove our product further with large multi-site organizations, which is exactly why, next slide, please, Andy. Um, which is exactly why I'm asking for any introductions you may have to uh, contacts within the energy or sustainability space, um, large organizations, councils, energy consultancies or facilities management firms. I've included my email on the slide so that you can reach out and we'd be so grateful for any contacts that you could introduce us to. So thank you very much. And thank you to Google. Peter, thanks so much. And it's, I think it's it's so wonderful that we're rounding off the presentations today with a business that has such a huge commitment to solving our sustainability challenges. Instead of thinking about the future, it feels like what you're building would be an absolutely critical element for sort of our vision for smart cities. So tell us a little bit about sort of your, you know, how you view the future and sort of the role that you could play in smart cities. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a there's a long way to go before we have a smart city, if I'm honest. Um, and that comes with uh, taking the data that we already have, making that data accessible, and then allowing people to actually act upon it. You know, not everyone in a, in a building has the full uh, spectrum they require to be able to make the changes um, that are needed to get to that net zero. It's not, it's, it's not, in ev no one can be a, an expert in everything. So I think what's important is that we are able to play a role in taking that data, making it uh, useful enough to be able to act upon, uh, and then make those investment decisions. Uh, like I said, if it's investing in a new boiler or investing in LEDs, it's it's so important that we can make, make that uh, transition for people. Fantastic. Peter, thank you so much. Congrats on a great business. And congrats to all 10 of our incredible entrepreneurs that we've had such a privilege of working with uh, for the past three months here at Google for Startups UK. I hope that you're all um, excited, inspired, um, you know, those of you with, you know, those of you that are investing in startups are ready to jump out and, and write checks. And speaking of investors, I'm very excited to be joined by two that are tell us a little bit about, a little bit about the view of, you know, of venture capital, um, uh, about, you know, what's, what's the opportunity um, in startups outside of London and what does this investment community uh, look like as well? So um, Poonam Folker, thank you so much um, for joining us. Both fantastic backgrounds, by the way, uh, I have to say. Um, really lovely to have you with us this afternoon. Um, if I could please ask you to give us a little bit of an intro about yourselves and your organizations. Poonam, do you want to start us off? Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Oh, what a wonderful afternoon. I've just loved uh, the, the hearing the presentations. So really well done to all the startups you rocked and uh, to Google for Startup UK. You've certainly done a wonderful job. So I'm Poonam Malik and uh, here uh, to talk about and do the drum roll for Scotland and the Scottish ecosystem and the investment scene that we have here. And uh, so I'm a board member for Scottish Enterprise, which is the regional economic development agency in Scotland. And the investor arm for the Scottish Enterprise is Scottish Investment Bank. And in terms of our, uh, I suppose, uh, the SIB tends to be uh, the most uh, active uh, investor um, in the UK in terms of number of deals after the crowdsource uh, and the CDS, I suppose, crowdfunding platform. Uh, but uh, we do this in partnership uh, and with uh, both uh, venture capitals and uh, private investors and angel investors. And my own uh, personal background is uh, life sciences and health and uh, med tech. Uh, but in general, um, I'm also um, 
a member of us investing women angels because uh coming we I mean, can't be investors and not talk about the issues that female founders and that's a very much a passion coming from the science side and the business uh, leadership side to support female founders so i would do that we are the angel investment group in scotland we are consisting of all female angels and we are trying to increase the number both from the uh, supporting and mentoring female founders but as well as increasing the number of female angel investors and working very much in partnership with our male colleagues because we need to do that together thank you brilliant thanks so much Poonam um Fulker, over to over to you hi yeah so I'm a I'm a partner at Amadeus Capsule um I think it's one of the oldest UK VCs um with offices in Cambridge and London although I personally am based in Macclesfield just just south of Manchester um <clears throat> I've also co-founded Tech North Advocates in order to help build more cohesive ecosystems um, um, up in the north because um, um, yeah, it felt that that was one of the things that was missing. Um, Amadeus is a uh, an early stage fund. You would probably call us a deep tech investor. We um, uh, uh, tend to invest in, in pretty uh, very often in science based innovation and um, uh, uh, and have been doing so outside of London um, uh, since our start. Given where our, our offices are and our found one of our co-founder Herman Hauser, the ARM founder, um, uh, uh, has a fantastic ecosystem in, uh, in in Cambridge. So a lot of a lot of the deals are there. We have invested a lot in London, but we also have a lot, invested a lot outside London. Our our latest uh, super duper champion, um, um, Graphcore, uh, uh, originates from Bristol, for instance. Um, uh, the first of our companies that raised money from the Future Funds based in Edinburgh. Um, so um, uh, uh, we are all over. Fantastic! Thanks so much for um, joining me this afternoon. Um, so, all the all the founders that we've uh, that that we've uh, met this afternoon, but also countless those that applied for the program we've spoken to are sort of saying the same thing, which is that fundraising when you're not in London is not as easy as it is when you are in London. That is sort of capital is capital is scarcer, less people that are actively investing. What's your view as, as investors? How much capital is available? Do you agree with the view? Do you disagree? What does that mean for you and for your organizations? So do you want both of us to answer that, Marta? Or? Was that specifically to Walker? I would like both of you to answer, but yeah, which uh, whichever one wants to start. Right. Uh, so I would say that yes, uh, London is the leading place for investment. There's no two ways about it, and in some cases, obviously, it is uh, the community that's present, and also the size of deals that gets done there. So uh, there are, um, if we leave some of the major skewed uh, numbers which is above 50 million or 100 million deals uh, that make up for the i think we've lost punam for 18 percent rather for of the d judgment uh, proportions uh, but if we take uh, the case of uh, example of uh, scotland am i lost yeah, Punam, I think you're back. back. I think you're back. Okay, right. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I don't know how much uh, you managed to hear, but I was saying that yes, I wouldn't. Uh, I will agree totally that the in terms of number of deals and the amount that goes of the larger uh, deals above fifty million and hundred million, uh, London is the leading place for that. But uh, where I would say in terms of Scotland, uh, say, for example, in uh, 2019, we have done 449 uh, million invested uh, from Scotland and the number of deals were 285. And uh, that's done from a various sources of venture capital, uh, government money, public sector money and private investors. So uh, there is a variety of uh, sources available. 
and there are uh, pros and cons each uh, set up there scotland being small people are more in contact with each other and i'm sure what the last four months have shown that it has le uh, level fielded everybody because we are all talking through the screen where you could be based in even uh, either aberdeen or in an island and you could uh, approach a london investor so that physical proximity seems to have taken away but in terms of now making the contact and then being in front of the groups uh, that regional and geographic challenges uh, will be interesting to see how we make that uh, leap from the physical to the online now Brilliant. Thanks, Pranam. Yeah. <clears throat> if I may add, I mean, it's, it's of course, London is the biggest, you know, the, the stats don't lie. Um, um, however, when you when you think about this, when you're based in San Francisco, or let's say just, just over the bridge in Oakland, and you want to go to San Jose, normal traffic that takes you two hours, which is exactly the time it takes you to take a train from Manchester to London. So if money doesn't come to you, go find the money. Um, um, it, it, it's something that when speaking to founders sometimes drives me drives me crazy the north is proud i get that and they say you know it's it's uh, we 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 are the we are the north we are we build great companies however you know have a look at where 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 the ecosystems are and don't be afraid to 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 go to london and uh, um, and, and speak to investors there um the ecosystem in london is is better developed it is more mature there's more support that is what it is, and it is evolving in other in other parts of the country. Manchester, um, which is most familiar to me, has has made huge steps forward over the last five, six, seven, eight years. Um, Edinburgh, I think, has always been its its special little pockets. Um, um, but you know, there's things happening in Belfast. There's things happening in Leeds. There's things happening in in, in Bristol. But they will arguably never be what they are in London because those places aren't as big. Um, and also, it takes time to develop ecosystems. But um, you know, it's not only Zoom in times of a crisis. It, it, it is Britain is a relatively small country compared to many others. Um, um, so you know, it's relatively quickly to get from A to B, and there's no reason why people shouldn't actually um, 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 reach out to others. Most funds I'm aware of um, um, will invest outside London. Um, funds that only have offices in London, um, you know, often have that weird north of Watford blindness. I get that, um, but um, uh, you know, let's 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 help educate them. And um, you know, founders are so re resilient, and 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 you know, you 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 you're solving so many hard um, um, problems, and you will go out of your way and do anything necessary. So don't stop doing the same thing when it comes to fundraising makes makes perfect sense thanks thanks for thanks for those comments and it's interesting you said you know if there's no money where you are go and look for the money i guess there is also the sort of the the, the flip side which is what does that look for investors obviously your job is to look for the hottest deals in the hottest sectors find the best entrepreneurs um there is a view that startups outside of london have lower valuations in comparison uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? And sort of, does that mean that for you know for for your funds, there is actually a tangible opportunity to be based outside of London because that means that you get first dibs. I mean, yes, theoretically that's true. Um, um, but I think first and foremost, you look for great teams and great and great startups. Um, um, you would argue that valuations outside London possibly should be lower because you know costs of run the costs of growing your startup are lower um you know you don't pay you don't pay the same rents you don't pay the same salaries so you basically um, um uh, can 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 run further with with less money um but i i i think it's you know i do not think that that is the deciding factor um and you are of course right you know hunting hunting in 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 a, in a pond that is uh, less populated with uh, uh, with fishermen or hunters is 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 arguably is arguably a good thing from an investor perspective. True, um, but at the at the very core, it is you know it is people look for 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 great deals, for great startups, for great products. Um, I think if I were to add to that point, I totally agree with Volker when he says uh, that the costs are down. I suppose, for an example, from a startup point of view, when you are just trying to build up, 
a 40% difference in your costs initially can make a huge difference. And that is the difference, uh, even though Edinburgh is the most expensive place behind London, the cost of setting up a company and living here is 40% lower than in London. So if a founder, a great idea, and they are look, and on the other hand, there is also a great setup in terms of the talent support that is available, the innovation centers and the academic universities that are available for the research and innovation develop. So there is that setup an ecosystem and uh, Scottish uh, them, for example, which Paul mentioned, Edinburgh, it is growing from that point of view. And it has been the second most attractive destination after London for uh, tech companies. So from that point of view, if a startup is looking to set up, that certainly all the ingredients are available, your costs are lower, and uh, you have the a perfect place for a startup to start it. And I agree with that, that the train ride probably is four and a half hours and uh, uh, you are not too far away and make the connections. And especially when now we are going to go more and more digital, why not take the less costs and uh, make the connections and travel a bit more for your, or even make connections online and join that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. There's also if you if you if you allow so so in addition one thing is if you only speak to you know two or three funds which might be active in your city um and ignore everyone else ignore that train ride to london um then um yes those funds will have higher leverage to press for for deals that they might deem to be more 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 positive for them in including lower valuations etc but you know there is, as a founder there's a way around that by just simply speaking to more people if you're if you if, if you're a startup in terms of in terms of team product traction etc is on par with anyone in london you know then all of a sudden you can say hey look guys you know i only need to raise two million versus the five that someone in London needed to raise to actually get 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 just as far. Um, and then it's a then it becomes a trade off that isn't, oh, you know, those two funds in Birmingham and Manchester and wherever, um, wherever uh, you know, they, they 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 have you um, by the neck and you have to go with it. Um, then you can basically just say, OK, you know, you, you're, you're weighing things. Um, uh, and it's important to basically kind of like open up that funnel there. And I'm saying that even even though I might be talking myself out of cheap deals here. <laughs> I think this is, but this is also this is what friendly investors are for, and this is also how ecosystems are built. Um, so uh, I think I've, that's. I've been a I've been a founder I've been a founder myself before, so it's, I, I I know how it feels on the other side. Amazing, amazing, and actually on the point of sort of founders. Uh, um, who or investors who used to be founders, I guess, Poonam, to your point earlier about Scotland, you know, the fact that such businesses as Skyscanner have been based out of Edinburgh, that also means that there is more people who have already done the startup journey, who have gained the talent, who have made the money. And maybe that also means that we can off the back of this um, sort of energize the angel investment communities as well to, to make sure that the talent that is already there also has access to, uh, to resources. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, both Skyscanner or FanDuel team, and that is what the tech ecosystem is uh, rising here, because along with the money, the crucial component of building the team is the experience and the management which who have done it and been there. So and that certainly is a big draw. Brilliant. Poonam Fulker, thank you so much. We're massively out of time because, uh, well, it's been it's been a fascinating afternoon. But I think if I were to try and summarize the um, the, the, the the wisdom that you've shared with us, it sort of sounds like um, Fulker, you're saying make sure that you go out and look for the money and don't limit yourselves or give them unnecessary leverage to your local investors. And I think Poonam, what you're also saying is that uh, you know make 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 the most of the fact that we have just learned to be more digital that uh that these that the distance has been reduced by the fact that we've all learned to build relationships fundraise manage teams uh remotely and off the back of this again sort of use to your advantage the fact that you can be based in a place where your cost is going to be lower but your brilliance is is still the same Thank you so much, uh, both of you, Puna Volker. It's been uh, such a privilege to be joined by you. I hope you enjoyed the pitches. And uh, I understand that many of these companies are still raising. So, you know, you know where your next, where your next deals might be coming from. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, See, absolutely. Thank you, Martha. Name. And it is an exciting time to be an <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yes, our, our session this afternoon is slowly coming to an end. But before, I need to introduce you to one last incredibly special person, uh, Mariama Bumanjal, a program manager at GFS UK. She's already got a few shout outs today. Um, but um, to those of you that are investors, startups, or just startup enthusiasts that have joined us this afternoon. Um, if you are wondering, are there more programs coming up our way? Will there be more showcases? Um, Mimi will be able to tell you all about that. So what's next in the world of Google Startups? Thank you so much, Marta. Hi, everyone. I'm Mariam Abumanjal, and I'm the program manager at Google for Startups UK. Wow, I'm so filled with joy and happiness right now. It has been an absolute pleasure to be working with 10 brilliant founders from every single corner of the UK. And um, thank you again for all the panelists who gave us some great insights into the UK, UK ecosystem today, its challenges, but more importantly, its opportunities outside the capital. We've heard today that founding a successful company is difficult. It's a difficult job for everyone. But because the startup playing field isn't level, some entrepreneurs have a tougher time than others. Many women, and people of color founders have comparatively limited access to capital, mentorship, talent, and networking opportunities. Particularly in times of economic downturn, like the current crisis, startups facing these challenges could use even more support. Google for Startups aims to, to empower startups and equip founders with the resources they need to solve today's biggest challenges. Today, I'm super excited to be announcing three new programs that will help European and Israeli startups access Google's products and experts to grow their businesses, including two programs for founders from underrepresented groups. Did you know that only 2% of VC funding go to women-founded startups? Imagine. Did you know that only 0.9% of VC funding go to black founders? So. If you're a woman or a black founder based in Europe, UK, and Israel, or if you know some incredible black and woman founders in Europe, UK, and Israel, please check out our new programs. We're very much looking forward to, to receiving your application, but more importantly, the team and I are very much looking forward to work with some brilliant black and woman founders in the next coming of months. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Well done to everyone today, and we're very much looking forward to staying in touch. Check out our social channels where you can hear more about our programs and all the initiatives that we're driving at Google for Startups UK. Thank you, and I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, everybody. It's been such a pleasure. See you next time.